Correggio is a small town located in the Emilia-Romagna region of northern Italy. With a rich history dating back to Roman times, it is known for its historical and artistic significance. One of its most notable attractions is the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, a remarkable fresco painted by the renowned Renaissance artist Antonio da Correggio, after whom the town is named. This masterpiece can be found in the Cathedral of Correggio and is a prime example of the town's cultural heritage. Correggio, while not as widely recognised as some of Italy's larger cities, is a place where history, art and tradition come together to offer visitors a glimpse into the country's cultural and artistic past. The town is haunted by the murders of three women whose bodies were disposed of by the killer by making their remains into soap and tea cakes. Over 80 years have passed since the events, yet the crimes are still talked about to this day, the chilling story serving as a dark reminder of the depths of human depravity. Leonardo Cinciulli was born on the 18th of April 1894 in Montella, a small town in the province of Avellino in the Campania region of Italy. Leonardo, a notably superstitious woman, was raised in a wealthy family. However, growing up, she struggled with her demons, and on at least two occasions, she attempted to take her own life. In 1917, she married registry office clerk Raffaele Pansardi. However, her mother strongly disapproved of this union, as she wanted to arrange her daughter's marriage to a man of whom both she and her husband approved of. A pivotal moment in Leonardo's life, her mother cursed her marriage, and her venomous words endlessly echoed in Leonardo's mind. Feeling uneasy about her mother's words, Leonardo visited a fortune teller who prophesied that she would marry and have many children, however all of them would not live to adulthood. She also spoke with a palm reader who stated, In your right hand I see prison, and in your left a criminal asylum. In 1921, the couple relocated to Lauria Pontenza, the hometown of her husband, where Leonardo faced legal consequences and was incarcerated for fraud in 1927. Leonardo fell pregnant 17 times, however, she suffered three miscarriages. Of the 14 children she gave birth to, by 1930 only four had survived. That year, more plight plagued Leonardo, whose home was destroyed by the Arpinia earthquake. The disaster claimed over 1,400 lives, left thousands injured, and over 100,000 people homeless. This was the catalyst for Leonardo and her family to move to Correggio, after they briefly took shelter in a home in Lariano. Leonardo was well liked in Correggio, and after so much loss in her life, she became very protective of her remaining children. In 1939, Giuseppe Pansardi, her eldest son, who was also her favourite child, signed up to the Italian army to fight for his country in the Second World War. Swimming in the depths of superstition and paranoia, Leonardo concluded that in order to keep her son and her three other children safe, prayers would not be enough, and she would have to claim four lives as an offering. Leonardo herself began to practice as a fortune teller, and was known around the neighbourhood to give readings to the locals. In 1939, Faustina Setti, aged 73, who was a lifelong spinster, was keen to find herself a husband, and Leonardo offered to help her. Reading cards, Leonardo told her that she could see a husband for Faustina in the near future. 
She told Faustina that there was a suitable husband in Pola, which is presently a part of Croatia and Slovenia, however at the time was a part of the Kingdom of Italy. Leonardo requested that Faustina should keep the news a secret from her loved ones, which she did. Excited about her future, Faustina brushed up on her appearance. She dyed her grey hair blonde and sold all of her possessions plus her home. She returned to thank Leonardo before departing, however she had no idea that she was prey about to fall into a deadly trap. Leonardo offered her a glass, the pair toasting to the future. Leonardo watched on as Faustina swallowed the spiked concoction. The sedatives rendered the woman unconscious, leaving her defenceless against Leonardo Cinciulli. She sent postcards to Faustina's loved ones, who believed her still to be alive. However, the sinister reality was that Cinciulli had struck Faustina with a hatchet, then had subsequently dragged the body to her kitchen, where she removed all of the woman's clothes and cut her victim into nine pieces with a saw and knife. She then drained the blood into a basin, and once the blood coagulated, she decided to add it as an ingredient in homemade chocolate and tea cakes, which she then gifted to neighbours and locals alike. Both she and her son, Giuseppe, also consumed them. Within a large cauldron, there was over 30 litres of water, caustic soda and the remains of Faustina Setti, and despite neighbours noticing a peculiar odour coming from Cinciulli's home, nobody questioned the source. With no living relatives, Faustina was soon forgotten, and 30,000 lira which had been in her possession went into the pockets of Leonardo Cinciulli. Her second victim was 55-year-old widowed schoolteacher Francesca Suavi. She was seeking work at another school, and Leonardo offered to aid her in finding employment. She told Francesca that she had secured her a job at a school in Piacenza, much to her delight. It was on the 5th of September 1940 when Francesca visited Cinciulli for the last time, and just like her first kill, she managed to convince her victim to write letters and postcards for family before drugging her beverage and then fatally attacking her with a hatchet. With her remains, she made batches of soap and pastries, which were once again distributed around the locale. Once she slaughtered her second victim, Cinciulli managed to steal 2,000 lira from her. 53-year-old Virginia Cacioppo, who was a soprano singer who allegedly performed at the Grand Opera House La Scala in Milan, became Leonardo's third victim. Virginia had dreamed of a happy life in the city, and Leonardo told her that she had managed to get Virginia a highly paid factory job in Florence. Leonardo told Virginia that she had been engaged in an affair with a member of the factory's hierarchy, which is how she managed to secure a secretarial job for her. Despite Leonardo insisting that the pair keep the conversation to themselves, Virginia did tell three friends about it, which would later be a decision which would result in the downfall of the infamous soap maker of Correggio. On the 30th of November 1940, Cinciulli murdered Virginia Cacioppo in the kitchen, the same way she had done previously. With the singer being of larger size than the average for a woman of that era, Cinciulli melted her remains and made lightly perfumed soap and candles. Following the murder, she received 35,000 lira, state bonds, cash and jewellery. Virginia's state bonds were cashed, and she also gave some of the jewellery away, which proved to be a grave mistake for Cinciulli, as all transactions would eventually be traced back to her. Suspicions also arose when she was spending an incredible amount of money, which contradicted with what locals knew of her living situation. 
Virginia's sister-in-law, Albertina Fanti, witnessed her entering Chinchuli's residence. However, after one hour and 40 minutes of surveillance, she never saw Virginia leave. Concerned, she approached the home and knocked on the door. She was greeted by Chinchuli. However, there was no indication that Virginia was alive and well in the property. Albertina's senses were overwhelmed by a vile smell coming from a large kettle on the stove, and once she departed, she travelled to the Reggio Emilia police station to inform them of her suspicions. Police were quick to respond and questioned Leonarda. She denied any involvement. However, there was a turn in the tide when police shifted their suspicions to her son, Giuseppe, who was involved in posting the letters and disposing of victims' bones in the river. The bones had been wrapped in paper, therefore it was assumed that Giuseppe didn't know what he was disposing of. Leonardo subsequently took full responsibility for the murders. Following this, police were convinced that her son had not been involved in the murders themselves, therefore he was declared an innocent man. Whilst in prison awaiting trial, she wrote a 700-page memoir named Confessions of an Embittered Life, where she described the murders in vivid and gruesome detail, as well as writing entries of recipes for the soap, cakes and pastries she made with the remains of the women. Before the memoir's completion, her son did not believe his mother was a murderess. However, the memoirs confirmed the truth. Authorities had been surprised that she had managed to kill and dispose of a body in less than two hours, and Leonardo decided to show them how it was possible. A group of police accompanied her to the Reggio Emilia morgue, where she expertly dissected a body into nine pieces in a shockingly short time of 12 minutes. The trial of Leonardo Cinciulli commenced in 1946, following the conclusion of the Second World War. Throughout, she showed no signs of remorse, and medical professionals were torn as to whether she was sane. Leonardo Cinciulli was found guilty of killing Faustina, Francesca and Virginia, and was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment, a life sentence in Italy, and with no official medical diagnosis being made due to the uncertainty between doctors, Leonardo was given an extra three years in a criminal asylum, eerily ringing true to the prophecy she had been given all those years ago. In Pozzuoli's Women's Criminal Asylum, Leonardo Cinciulli died on the 15th of October 1970, aged 76, from cerebral apoplexy. Her body was returned to her family, and since her death, plays and films have been made depicting her life and crimes. The weapons used in the murders and the pot where the victims were boiled were donated to the Criminology Museum in Rome, where they can still be seen today. Cinciulli's gruesome acts, driven by an obsession with superstition and a twisted sense of maternal love, have left an indelible mark on the annals of criminal history. Her story will forever stand as a grim testament to the darkest recesses of human nature, a stark reminder that evil can lurk even in the most unexpected places.